Welcome to Commons Conversations, a series of interviews with campaigners sharing their experiences and insights into activism, learning in movements, radical history, and more. This episode features a conversation between Terokura O'Connell Rapira from the POD, Centre for Healing Justice, and Laniuk, a writer, visual artist, and performer of poetry, speculative fiction, and short memoir. They discuss a range of topics, including the power of Indigenous solidarity, love of land, resistance to rainbow capitalism, and the role of creativity and emotion in achieving story sovereignty and social justice. This episode is from our second series and was originally broadcast by Community Radio 3CR. The podcast is produced by the Common Social Change Library, a website containing over 1,000 resources for campaigners, which can be accessed for free at commonslibrary.org. The library contains many other podcasts, including other episodes in the Commons Conversation series. Kia ora everyone, my name is Te Kura, um, and I've been invited to be a host of Commons Conversations uh, by Holly Hammond, and I'm here with Laniok, who is a Larakia, Kanaraka and Gurindji and French political creative, whose art practice is grounded in cultural language and land reclamation. Laniok writes and performs poetry, speculative fiction, short memoir, and is a visual artist. She also gives lectures, moderates panels, and runs workshops. Welcome to the show, Laniok. Thank you so much for having me, Tarokta. I was asked by Holly Hammond, who runs the Commons Library, to do an interview with a campaigner of my choosing. And you were one of the first people who came came to mind. So thank you for agreeing to have this conversation. I know that you were a bit hesitant at first because you don't really consider yourself a campaigner. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit as to why. Yeah, I, I remember when you first approached me about speaking on this podcast. And I was so confused. I was like, what has that got to do with me? And I was like, I don't know if I'm the right person. Like there are plenty of other people that sit on my intersection that are doing I don't know it kind of feels like bigger work more sort of organized and visible demonstrations I suppose of like movement building and organizing and I you know I'm always a little bit conscious of like taking up space that isn't sort of mine to to be in um and there are plenty of people of course there are so many people in our community that are doing incredible work that deserve to be platformed so I was a little bit like "Mm, I don't know if I'm the fit so (laughs) we agreed that part of this podcast would be you explaining to me why I'm the fit when on paper and I suppose to myself I really just see myself as an artist I'm a writer. I get up on stage every now and again and perform some poetry, but I don't really know if that is the same as being an organizer or a movement builder. Mm. So, you know, to flip the script a little bit and to be the interviewer, Tarakura, welcome. Can you please explain, <laughs> explain to me uh, why I'm here? <laughs> I think I see movement building and campaigning and community organizing being organized around like two core po. Um, po is a Maori word that refers to the post that is in the middle of our marae or our meeting houses. It's kind of the central point um, in which we organize ourselves. A po metaphorically often refers to a kind of something that grounds us um, and guides us in what it is that we do. And so I think with campaigning and movement building and organizing, I see it I see it as kind of two core po, which are political change strategies and cultural change strategies. And if I'm honest, I just really don't think that campaigners who are often lawyers and academics are the ones that are going to lead our cultural change strategies. It's artists that know how to do that. It's artists that know how to imagine and articulate new futures. It's artists that um, can grip the hearts of people um, and shift minds um, and generate emotions, which can generate action. And so I guess I, I was interested in inviting you to this um, corridor because I wanted to talk about the intersection point between arts and activism and the necessity of building out strategies that weave together narrative change as well as political change. A few things sort of come to mind when you're speaking. I was thinking about the the role that art plays in helping us access our emotions process our understanding of situations and you know when we're talking about politics or we're talking about social justice issues climate justice issues one of the biggest blocks and I think I'm feeling that at the moment you know in the current climate that we're in with the invasion and escalating violence and colonization of of Gaza and the West Bank in Palestine one of the major blocks before action often is a process of emotion I feel like I'm seeing a lot of people maybe hesitant to talk, um, not just because they don't understand the situation on paper, but because emotionally they don't 
they're, they're having trouble processing where they land in this situation, struggling to process the, the violence and the horror that they're witnessing on their screens. And I think that art is such an important part of being able to tap into ourselves, tap into our bodies, tap into our emotions. And I, I see that with performance poetry, the ways that people can be tra- transformed through witnessing art, creating art. And so the follow-on thought for me that came from that was the way that whiteness in the Western world creates this sort of elite culture around art and creates this idea of art as like a luxury and an excess and that it's really something that you do if you have time or if you have the luxury of time and money to access the resources to create art and that it's not for everyone. Whereas as Indigenous people, we understand art as being an integral part of the human experience that creating something, expressing ourselves and connecting through art is part of the very fabric of life, of existence. And so I'm also curious to talk about the ways that we are discouraged from understanding ourselves through art and also the ways that accessing art in our daily life is a form of resistance and contribution. One of the things I've heard you talk about in the past in terms of poetry in particular is that it is a very accessible means of storytelling and, you know, getting messages out there, you know, all you need is a, is a pen and a paper or, you know, I know that you take a lot of notes into your, into your phone while you're in the middle of doing things in your everyday life. And, and, I, and I think about the CIA during the kind of rise of the Black Panther movement in the United States and the so-called, in, in Turtle Island, they very deliberately targeted poets because they knew that poets have this incredible ability to capture and storytell the power of our movements and create and articulate and imagine futures that galvanize people to take radical action. Um, And so I wondered if you could speak a little bit to the power of political poetry in particular. I'll often say to people that there is something really special about the access- accessibility of poetry. You know, if I and I, I'll often say that if I want to make a movie, there's a huge amount of resources that have to go into pr- the production of a film. Even at, it, at, it, at its most basic level, there's a lot of time that's required, usually a lot of money that's required. You need to have a, a network of people supporting you in the filming, maybe the acting, the production. The bill just gets bigger and bigger and longer and longer. And I I think that there's something so beautiful and so powerful about poetry as an art form in that you you don't even necessarily need a pen and paper. Even if you've just got a good memory, you can just like create a little a little poem in your mind and have that there for you. And it's such an incredible tool of emotional processing and storytelling. I think because of its accessibility and because of its Flexibility, because poetry, although our schools wrongly will tell us that there is a form and a method and a a rigidness to poetry, anything can be poetry. It can be a couple of lines. It can be a book's worth of storytelling. It can rhyme. It cannot rhyme. There's so much flexibility, which allows a playfulness and a freedom in our expression, in our storytelling that often is withheld from us in so many other art forms. And I enjoy I enjoy that as a poet in that really what I create is mine to define. And that comes through, I think, with political poetry as well, in that we it allows a, a spaciousness to either capture the beauty of our worlds, um, the complexity of our worlds, and we get to share that through simple storytelling, which means that a lot of people that are otherwise locked out of the arts world are able to access poetry. Aboriginal people, people of colour, working class people, you can write a poem on the tram, you can write a poem waiting at the light, you can write a poem on shift. And so that means that we get to hear so many beautiful stories that otherwise aren't platformed in popular media, art and storytelling which I suppose, yes, is how we come to places like the CIA targeting poets, which just seems, again, sort of, I suppose, coming back to the beginning of this conversation, seems really bizarre to me because I'm like, we're just poets. (laughs) We're just, you know, (laughs) writing cute poetry and doing cute things and wanting to tell our story. And how threatening is that? 
How mm. threatening is that? The ability to tell our story yeah. terrifies government enough for the CIA to target poets. I've been thinking about in this political moment we are, where we are seeing mainstream media outlets throughout the so-called Western world, throughout the colonised world, water down and obfuscate what is happening in Palestine. I've been thinking a lot about how our movements are all too reliant on mainstream media as a tool for us to get our messages out into the world. I've been a part of a lot of different campaigns and both in Te Whenua Mui Moia, which is the Māori word for the con- this continent, um, as well as Aotearoa, where I come from. And there's a huge amount of time and energy that goes into how we can get mainstream media to tell our stories. And I would love to see an equivalent or a shift away from this kind of upholding of systems that don't really serve us or the kaupapa, the causes that we believe in, towards a prioritizing of and a telling of our own stories and a kind of embracing and embodying of story sovereignty. Because I think you're exactly right. Settler colonizers, settler or invader state governments know how powerful we are when we have our own platforms and can tell our own stories. And that is why poets and journalists who who tell stories of truth are often the targets of, of state violence. Yeah. And I think that when we when we internalize the idea that art is not for us, we then come to understand that storytelling isn't for us. And then we give control to someone else to tell our story and to understand our story for us, which I think is the role of you know, media, I suppose, colonial history and, yeah, popular sort of entertainment when we understand or we believe that storytelling isn't something that we're capable of doing, then we relinquish our story to someone else, which I think is why it's so significant and so important for invader cultures and colonial cultures to make us believe that storytelling is not something that is inherent in your being. As a poet... (laughs) You know, I've had to undo a lot within myself to understand my pathway is something legitimate. You know, I remember in high school, this sort of idea that you had to get a real job and that, you know, being an artist wasn't a real job and you better learn maths and you better learn science because you're going to have to make money, you know. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, being a poet is a flashy job where I, where I make a lot of money, but it is a legitimate work and it does contribute something to society. Art creation does contribute something to society. And so I think it's an interesting strategy on on the part of the colony to undermine art and storytelling and for capitalism to to take and to deprioritize art creation from, I suppose, payment and and to create this idea of yeah, the elite art as being something inaccessible to So I'm interested in talking to you about some of the political themes that I see in your poetry and some that I pulled together when I was doing a little bit of prep for this is the mana and power of Indigenous women, the importance of global Indigenous solidarity, rainbow capitalism and the perils of our movements being co-opted, the abolition of police and prisons, Indigenous tokenism and the climate movement, um, and Indigenous love of land, I think, is a real core thing that I see in your work. And so my question is, which one of those topics would you like to explore first? It's so interesting hearing you read these out loud because I've never really thought or looked at the list of topics that come through. It's always just, it's just been a slow process of, you know, responding to the world um, and responding to what I'm seeing. And so when you, when you create these sort of like dot point themes, I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. I I hadn't quite realized um, the scope of what I've been covering through poetry while really just trying to tell my own story and my own perspective. I can't help but but smile at the topic of, I guess, rainbow capitalism. It's a sad sort of sarcastic smile. So maybe that's a good place to start. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start because it's also on theme or on brand in terms of what we're talking about today, which is a lot about narrative strategies. And I do a lot of trainings with campaigners and community organisers. And I talk about this concept, which is a right wing concept called the, um, the Overton window which is basically this idea that through narrative strategies and legal strategies, you you shift ideas from being unthinkable and radical to sensible and popular. And I often use uh, marriage equality as an example of a shift in the Overton window, because often people will think marriage equality and the campaign for that to, to be passed happened, you know, just a couple of years earlier, but in the Aotearoa context, and I think it's the same as the Whenua Moimoya, um, I would say it started 
long before that and the kind of moments that I pinpoint is that in the 1980s, lesbian women and gay men largely organized against the criminalization of homosexuality or homosexual law reform to be realized, which essentially means removing criminal penalties for practicing homosexual acts. And that humanized us to the colony and created the conditions in which a few years later or a few decades later, civil unions could be passed in which we could enter into legally binding arrangements that um, made it easier for us to be recognized by the state in terms of our, our relationships and our love, which then created the conditions in which marriage equality was possible. And so every single one of those shifts humanize queer people a little bit more uh, to the colony and decolonize our relationship with homosexuality and queerness. But so much so that we're now in a situation where we have banks and the military and police rocking rainbow flags. And so, you know, you had a, um, you were commissioned to write a poem for Pride March and you created something um, that spoke to what it was that you were seeing. And then the people who had commissioned you decided not to platform the piece that you had created. And so you released it anyway yourself. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that poem, that process and the message. I was approached by Pride March to write a poem about Pride March to be aired during the Pride March. And I sort of remember seeing the email and kind of knowing at the time that they weren't going to like what I had to say. I think that there's a lot of interrogation that the queer community has to do in what we are moving towards and what it is fighting for. I think that we really have to be more critical about the role that our identities are playing in the continuation of violence and colonisation. The poem that I wrote, March with Pride, really just expressed what I feel like I've been witnessing in the queer community, which is a prioritization for assimilation over liberation, and that we are making the mistake of measuring the safety that we experience the closer that we get to the heart of white supremacy and colonization for freedom. And so we kind of get <laughs> water-fed these rewards from the broader society if we comply with what is appropriate behavior, if we accept the presence of armed forces like the police and military in our community, which we know uphold systems of violence and continue to colonize Aboriginal land, continue to colonize other Indigenous lands across the world, if we accept and allow ourselves to be appropriated into that identity, then we can continue to experience some form of acceptance, which is conditional. And the queer community continues to experience violence from these armed forces. And if we excuse that behaviour, then we can continue to pretend and be under the guise of, of safety. So I was trying to find ways to tap into that in this poem and to really sort of talk about and to, to, to say that I will not march and pride march with cops. I refuse. I refuse. And I think that that is an accessible place. At this point in time, I think that was an inaccessible place to come into this conversation of the ways that queer identity is being appropriated into white supremacy and colonisation, um, particularly with, I suppose, the global awakening of the Black Lives Matter movement. It was a time that perhaps that message would be received a little bit more than if I'd written that poem, say, five years ago or 10 years ago. It might not have spoken to people in the same way, but with the current political global awakening that we're experiencing with the Me Too movement, with the Black Lives Matter movement, and I think now with the narrative shift that we're seeing across Palestine of not just interpersonal or um, cultural conflict, but actually colonization and oppression. We have the colonizer and the colonized indigenous. I think that we're able to use some of these more accessible topics to really shine a light on broader issues. So I think that was my approach with the March with Pride poem was that I wanted to talk about the presence of cops, which allowed me to also talk about the ways that our identities as queer people are being used to hide the violence of the police and is being appropriated into the other areas of violence and assimilation.
Yeah, I think that we in this political moment are seeing just how powerful that kind of pinkwashing can be, right? Like if you go into any comment section of anything about what's happening in Palestine and people are um, expressing solidarity with the people in Palestine, there's someone who leaves some kind of comment that says something along the lines of queer people are poorly treated in Palestine um, and you wouldn't last a day there or something like that. And so they, the kind of amorphous settler colonial supremacist governments and the corporations that uphold them are very aware of what it is that they're doing and the power of weaponizing our identities for their own ends, which is why we as people that sit on the intersections of those identities have to be vigilant and have to be protective of the mana of our identities and conscious of what it is that we are giving power to and what it is that we are taking power away from. I think that queerness is such a beautiful intersection of solidarity. Queer people exist in every corner of this world and the intersection of queerness is one of love, one of self-love, one where we are allowed to, we, where we allow ourselves to experience the world outside of a colonial binary and one where we define and redefine ourselves outside of these systems and one where we experience love and redefine love outside of colonial systems with other people. And so I think it's a really beautiful intersection that reaches all areas of this world and queer solidarity is so powerful because we understand our solidarity to not be transactional. And I think that really confuses the colonizer because colonialism and capitalism is built on transaction. And so when our solidarity is so powerful that someone says, why would you ever support Palestine? If you were there, you wouldn't last a second. And we say that's not what solidarity is. We're not in this for transaction. We show up for anyone and for everyone's liberation for the betterment of this world. And I think that queer liberation and queer solidarity is such a threat to the colony. Of course, it's a priority to assimilate us into their systems because if we actually lent into the power of our identities, into the power of our queer experience that, that exists and challenges colonial binary so magically and so effortlessly, if they can't control that, then they're in trouble. And so, of course, they have to assimilate us and they have to appropriate our cultures. And it's really important that we remain critical of that assimilation process and continue to resist it every step of the way. And unfortunately, one of our most popular and visible expressions of resistance, Pride March, has been co-opted by capitalism and by cops. And there are so many of us that can't engage with our our expression of cultural liberation because of the presence of cops and many one, other criticisms. One campaign that I'm really proud of having been involved in when I was living in Aotearoa, after a lot of community conversations, the Auckland Pride board asked that police don't march in uniform. So they were still invited to be part of the march, but that them being there in the presence of the uniforms was just made people feel unsafe because of the role that they play in upholding colonial violence. The cops got mad and sad about that and said, fine, we want nothing to do with you. And then a bunch of corporations pulled their funding for, for Pride to go ahead. And um, I remember I was traveling to Turtle Island at the time for a conference and I was just so sad because I grew up in Tamaki Makoto, um, which is the Māori name for Auckland. And I remember that Pride was one of those sites of visibility that was really important to me as a young person, even though it didn't really necessarily speak to me because glitter and rainbows and expensive floats isn't necessarily my vibe, but seeing happy gay people made me happy and it made me feel safer to be out. Yeah. And so I remember I was flying to this conference and I got in touch with a bunch of queer people and we decided to launch a crowdfunding campaign to raise funds to replace the funding that would have gone into it from corporations. And hundreds of people chipped in and we managed to raise not a huge amount of money, I think, compared to what corporations were giving. I think it was about 30K. We returned Pride to its roots, to, to community. And that year, thousands of queer people marched and um, for many of our disabled whanau um, or relations, family members, it was the first time that the march was accessible to them. And 
I think a lot about, you know, the the necessity of intersectionality in our politic. And and I think one of the things that queer movements have to teach the rest of our movements is this ability to build relationships of, of care and kinship outside of um, family structures, often because we have been kicked out of our family structures. And so we know what it is to build chosen family and to build networks of mutual aid and care. And then I think about you know, the disability justice movement and what they have to teach us, which is how to be vulnerable with one another and ask each other for support, how to create movements and strategies that move at the pace of our bodies and our well-being, how we can organize for justice without killing ourselves, without making ourselves sick. And one of the things I've always appreciated about your approach to your politic is that you have, you've taught me a lot about what it means to weave disability justice into my organizing, but also into my into language, into the words that we use. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit to um, to that. Oh, that's such a big topic. <laughs> the disabled people in my life have taught me a level of compassion and kindness and safety that I have never witnessed anywhere else. I think that at the heart of disability justice is a world of care. I feel really emotional. I feel like I want to cry. I think it's, I think for, and I'm so happy to hear that, you know, my my prioritising of disability justice has reached and, and influenced your politic as well. But my my understanding of disability justice is so informed and, and rooted in the, the love and experience of disabled people in my life that have taught me so much through their love. And I think that to move towards a world of accessibility for all people is to really create systems of care for everyone. I think, I guess I want to say that it's, I feel sad that my education on disability justice has fallen on the shoulders of individuals that I'm in relationship with. It wasn't until I tried to go to a Pride after party in Adelaide and a friend of mine who uses a wheelchair couldn't get into any of the after parties. They all had stairs. The one that was accessible was completely packed and was at capacity. And so we tried to go to another and we couldn't, we literally were unable to get in and I think that was such a moment for me where I was like this is not what queerness is this is not what community is about no one should ever be unable to access community and have such a solid and resounding no to their ability to access community and of course you know um, wheelchair access is just one of many access issues that we have to to take in consideration when we're you know creating spaces and building and upholding community but it's through you know an interpersonal relationship that my politics around access have been informed I don't know I'm just sort of like what are the ways that we continue to shift culture and the ways that we create community so that that labor just doesn't constantly fall on disabled people I think we're having slow shifts in that direction and particularly as our understanding of the category of disability, we're understanding that to also open up. And so more people are paying attention to these, to the details of access in a way that maybe hasn't existed before. But disability is another important intersection that again crosses every every area of this world, particularly to consider that the world is becoming in increasingly increasingly militarized and populations are experiencing the violence of colonization either through the prison industrial complex through genocide and war the the population of disabled people across the world increases so disability justice concerns everyone and is such an integral part of the liberation of our lands and our people 
and I like what you say about um, you know, we we can lift some of this labor from disabled folk, from individual disabled folk from having to to do this. And I know that I mean you probably wouldn't advertise this about yourself, but I know that you have a writer in place for um performances, which is to say that if the venue is not wheelchair accessible, you won't perform there. And there's there's those kinds of everyday acts that we can put in place to ensure that we are uplifting the mana um, on the dignity and the kind of life force power, inherent life force and power of disabled people in our everyday acts and in the way that we show up and in the in the places that we give our power to as well. I am going to move us just in the interest of time to talking about global Indigenous solidarity, which is another theme that I see come up in your poetry, but also because you lived in Aotearoa for a year, which is where I first met you, and um, you've written about Māori and Aboriginal resistance and solidarity between our our various nations and use speculative fiction as a tool to imagine futures in which we've liberated ourselves. And so I guess my question is what you noticed about Māori resistance um, and movement building from your time in Aotearoa and how that informs your politics. And then I guess anything else you want to speak to from your your visits to other areas around the world where you've spent time with Indigenous peoples. Okay, this is going to sound really dramatic. <laughs> but I feel like my time in Aotearoa gifted me hope, which I don't think was something that I was carrying consistently before spending a year in in Wellington. I think like many Indigenous people, many colonised Indigenous people, I'm carrying a lot of grief, a lot of grief for the things that we as Aboriginal people have had to put down to hold other tools and tactics of survival and for the things that have been taken out of our hands. And I carry a lot of grief for my lack of language, my lack of access to our languages. And spending a year in Aotearoa, I was able to witness such strong language formation and I found out that Reo Māori didn't become an official language until I think the 1970s right. and I remember finding that out and just sitting down and you know counting the decades on my hand and being like in someone's lifetime in someone's lifetime Reo Māori has come to such strength and such vibrancy that you can hear whole radio programs completely in Tereo. You can watch game shows. I remember sitting in a hotel room watching a game show on free to air TV completely in Tereo Māori. And I was I was just so shocked. And obviously our situation and our experience of colonization has its similarities and has its differences. And our road of language reawakening, strengthening and maintaining will look different to that of Te Reo. But I saw what had been built in someone's lifetime and I realised that my dreams for language return is not as far away as what I thought it was. And that was such a special and valuable experience to be able to see the work and strength and success of another Indigenous people. And I think that we have a lot to learn from one another. We are learning a lot from one another. We have always learned a lot from one another. Um, We've strategized and shared solidarity in in our resistance and in our seeking of justice since, you know, the colonizers arrived. And I've had other experiences of my my politics and my vision being informed by other Indigenous people. I was recently in Timor and had the the good fortune, the the blessings to to sit with some Indigenous people a few hours outside of Kupang in Molo. And that was also such a, a special experience to see their journey with food reclamation and the ways that they're bringing their Indigenous foods and their Indigenous practices back into their communities and back into their day-to-day and combating a lot of what the colonisation of their lands has done in terms of planning shame 
associated with their cultures and their foods. And so to be able to see and witness that and also be informed and to learn from that, I think there's so much that that global Indigenous solidarity can bring to our movements when we come to each other's lands and communities and work with with love and respect and solidarity. Our, our own politics and our own movements can be informed and strengthened. One of the things I love about the Māori language revitalization movement is that it was built by nannies and aunties in the 1980s in their setting up of what is called kohanga reo, which is language nests. And it was essentially lots of Māori women, Indigenous women, who are always doing the most, seeing the plight of our languages and deciding to do something about it. And what they decided to do was to solve the problem themselves rather than relying on government to solve the problem for us. And so they went about setting up language nests in homes, in sheds, in garages, in community halls, in marae, in meeting houses, and just started teaching our babies and our children our languages. And then through the Kohanga Reo movement, it became a site of political organising, which also contributed to campaigns around land rights and water rights um, and issues around self-determination and sovereignty. And so I often think, again, to the to the kind of opening discussion we're having around this kind of the po of political change and cultural change to my mind when we talk about indigenous ways of campaigning and organizing and and building movements language reclamation is part of that cultural reclamation is part of that the returning of land the returning of water the returning of ceremony and i know that's something that's really important to you and the work that you're doing as well and so one of the reasons i want to talk to you is because there is a campaign happening right now on your lands which are under threat by the military and i wondered if you could talk a little bit to what's happening on your lands and what you want people to know about the next kind of couple of months? So at the moment in Darwin, about a 15 or 20 minute drive from the city of Darwin, there's an area of land called Lee Point, Binibara or Lee Point, and it's at threat of being demolished. It's this beautiful, beautiful, lush area of old growth bush. It's in an sort of urban-ish environment. It, it hits the water, it hits the ocean. It's got um, lush bird life and it's, it's a beautiful place of biodiversity within an urban location. And Defence Housing Australia is currently trying to get the paperwork across the board to to demolish this area of old growth bush to build about 800 houses for the defense force but it's also open to private sales and is being is being advertised to an international community as well and since these plans were were made public, um, people in Darwin have been protesting and resisting this destruction and this demolishing of bush, which is on my grandfather's country, Latakia country. Most of my family lives in Darwin. I grew up in Darwin. And I sort of was watching this all sort of taking place over social media while living in Melbourne and being a little bit unsure about what I could do to support because at the time what was the most important sort of course of action was to to camp out on location to stop the bulldozers from coming through and to to push back the the demolishing and so since then Defence Housing Australia has had to go back to sort of review their paperwork and have postponed development destruction till March 31st of 2024, which buys us a little bit of time to continue campaigning and to protect that area of land, which is significant for so many reasons. It has, holds a lot of significance for Latakia culture, Latakia kinship, and holds a lot of stories 
and is an important place for us. It's also an important place of biodiversity for migratory birds, for endangered species of birds and lizards that live in the area. And I think something that I think about a lot as well is that it, it holds significance and importance for even the city of Darwin itself in keeping the surrounding area cool. So I think with, with these cities, you know, they're really just so focused on expansion and adding concrete onto concrete onto concrete and then wondering why it's so hot. <laughs> and then they'll they'll put into place like greening strategies and greening programs to like to combat the heat and to, you know, enrich biodiversity. You know, I even saw um, through my studying of the situation this plan that that Darwin City Council had created to green the area almost simultaneously as these plans to destroy Lee Point and its biodiversity came into play. So there's a lot of contradiction happening, but a lot of organised resistance from community members, from Latakia people, and we are in an important time of pause which buys us a little bit of time to continue resisting and continuing to protect that land before March 31st of next year. I know that you recently completed the First Nations Impact Lab with um, Garawa and Doc Society, which, because you're interested in working, I guess, at the intersection of film and truth-telling and justice, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the campaign itself that you're going to be working on over the next couple of months um, and how you're weaving together arts and activism to save your lands. You know, it's really interesting because I, as you know, we said at the beginning of all of this, I don't consider myself a campaigner and I almost don't consider this a campaign, even though I think on paper it presents itself as a campaign strategy and it is a very well thought out, I suppose, attempt at, influencing narrative and I was thinking about this last night thinking about what the word campaign means and why it doesn't land so softly in my body and I think part of that is because rather than seeing this as a campaign or a moment with a beginning and an end it really feels like my ancestral responsibility and that has no beginning and that has no end and that that is a continuation of relationship with land and protection of land. So what I'm hoping to achieve over the next few months is a shifting of culture and of narrative about that space, which uh, which is, you know, really just building on the work that people in Darwin have been doing to protect Lee Point. You know, the existing campaign, the existing strategy that has been underway um, for months now in protecting that land. And what I'm hoping to do is just contribute to that that work. I completed Garawa and Doc Society's um, Impact Lab, which spoke to the ways that we can influence policy and influence social change through storytelling through documentary and I hadn't thought about doing a documentary before attending the impact lab I was sort of focused on the skills that I had available to me at the time which was like okay well I can do some videos for social media I can do some videos for Instagram maybe I could write a poem and then sort of seeing the ways that documentaries are an important strategy of storytelling and weaving in fact, emotions, different um, arguments and perspectives, it can be a really powerful tool for narrative shifting. So now I'm doing a documentary. (laughs) Um, And going uh, home to Darwin to record some stories and to record some elders and their relationship to that area of land in hopes to inform the broader discussion around the protection of that land because it I think that I think that the value of Aboriginal culture is still a little bit lost on the wider 
public. Yeah. And the importance of protecting land, the importance of, of protecting our lands for the continuation of culture, for the continuation of biodiversity, for the continuation of human existence. <laughs> it's just a little bit lost on the colony and capitalism. It's just a, there's just like a little stepping stone that's missing. So I'm hoping through my art, through documentary and filmmaking, we can strengthen that stepping stone to help people understand how important it is to protect land and water for everyone. You know yeah. how we can end, you know how we can wrap this up. Your poem. No, Tarokura. My question to you <laughs> is how so given all of that we've talked about in terms of poetry and art and and resistance, I'm still yet to be convinced that I am a campaigner and the right person for you to be interviewing. I think your hesitation around the word campaign is a good one because you're a person that's so passionate about the power of language and words and I would hazard a guess that campaigning has a lot of origins or at least a lot of use in military terms in capitalistic spaces um we most commonly parliamentary politics exactly and none of those things really speak to the politics that you have and so I can understand your aversion and your resistance to that word and also I know that the people that mostly listen to this podcast are campaigners. And I guess I'm interested in, just to be explicit, expanding our understanding of what campaigning is. As a person, I'm a person that self-identifies as a campaigner. I've poured the last 15 years of my life into campaigning, community organizing and movement building to achieve real world political change. And um, I have come to believe that it is essential for us in our movement building that we weave um, cultural change strategies into our political change strategies and that we do not have the tools to do that um, without artists. I've been reflecting a lot about Indigenous, I guess, resistance over multiple generations and I've come to believe that it is our commitment to cultural perpetuity the idea that our culture continues in perpetuity that we continue to exist our languages our ceremonies our practices our beliefs our knowledges the commitment to ensuring that those things exist generation after generation after generation is what has enabled us to survive horrific cruel despicable acts from invader state governments over multiple decades it's our organized resistance but it's also our commitment to our culture and the strength that that gives us that has enabled us to survive these moments and to rebuild from these moments and so yeah I think the invitation to you to be a part of the space and to designate you a campaigner despite you not wanting to identify as a campaigner is more for the campaigners among us than I think it is a you and I think uh, resistance to that term makes absolute sense so with that I asked you at the beginning if um before we started recording if you'd be willing to close us out with a poem um, of your choosing for the listeners of this podcast and this radio show and so I wonder which poem you've decided to share with us today I think given given the context of the time that we find ourselves in with the ongoing colonization of Palestinian land and the attempted genocide of its people. I thought I would offer a poem that I wrote in 2019 for the Aboriginal and Palestinian Solidarity Community Paper, the Sunday paper, um, which was a pleasure to, to write to. When I started writing this poem, I was really trying to weave in as many arguments and facts and dates and really just wanting to try and inform a wider community of what was happening in Palestine historically and at that time in 2019. And while trying to write this poem and spending weeks listening to podcasts and writing down, you know, all of these dates, the statistics, I realised that the poem that wanted to be written and that needed to be written was a poem of grief and 
of what I was feeling for Palestine and for the people of Palestine and for Indigenous people everywhere. I suppose I offer this poem to the listeners also as an opportunity to use poetry as a place of emotional and political processing. What is the poem that your body is asking you to write? And so this poem is called Only Words. What use is poetry, Palestine? I am scrolling through your suffering bombs land in the beds of your children, divided by oceans, brought together by a scream. I grieve for you, Palestine. I have nothing to give but words, no matter the weight or ache or yearning for your release. I speak with your daughters, Philistine. We list all the things we would be if our existence wasn't predetermined by colonialism, if I wasn't busy trying to sew together all the missing and faded parts of me. I tell her I would bake cakes. She tells me she would deep dive oceans and seas. We would write love poems for sun-drenched summer days and publish them in deep red-bound books. A laughter would bubble to the surface and I could find something funnier in this world than my own misfortune to laugh at. We laugh loudly anyway, pushing our joy from the deep trenches of our sadness and longing, breaking through our fear. I would be soft enough to cry. She would be soft enough to break. I wonder what it must feel like to not have to be brave. I have only words, Philistine. Some days I barely even have hope. I dream for us. And wonder of your creation stories. What brought the first olive seed to grow at our feet? How were your skies raised? What brings your rivers to meet? Who is listening to your morning calls and your night songs as your children sleep? I have only my words for listening. So I send the rains that rise from Delangua to fall to the olive branches of Bethlehem to raise the flowers of Litha, the Gaza rushing down the street to meet with your own spirit and join with our collective dream from our rivers to our seas until our lands are free. It's beautiful, thank you. Good luck for your campaign to protect your lands and for the folks that are listening, they can keep an eye out for some videos and some materials to be coming out around this closer to Invasion Day. And there'll be ways for people to take action in solidarity with the mahi, um, the work of your people. Um, is there anything, any last partnering announcements, anything that you want to say um, before we sign off? I would like to say that one of the things I have been reflecting on a lot this week with the escalation of violence and genocide in Gaza was that when things really began to escalate a lot of things were put into a lot of things were pri- reprioritized and I realized that perhaps a lot of the grievances that I was feeling amongst um, other activists and the tensions between different spaces although maintaining our relationships can be difficult I think it's been an interesting or an important reminder of where our grievances really belong and that's with systems and that with people and it's an important time for us to re-strategize and build in tools of strengthening our communities to prepare us for the work ahead. It's very uh, Katniss Everdeen, Hunger Games of you. Um, remem- <laughs> remember who the real enemy is, <laughs> which is important. And I think one thing you and I have t- talked about a lot as well is um, the importance of building our skills in navigating conflicts within our movement spaces so that we Absolutely. don't stifle our own momentum when, when our relationships are torn apart because of the division that the colony and the capitalists thrive on and push onto us as well. And so that also requires active resistance. You've been listening to Commons Conversations, produced by the Commons Social Change Library a website containing over 1,000 resources for campaigners, all of which can be accessed for free at commonslibrary.org.